the Spread of BS podcast. I want to keep on thanking you guys for all the support. Uh, I don't know where I'd be without the podcast. One of the things. Thank you guys. Keep on sharing the videos, watching them. Good. Thank you to all my Patreon members. I appreciate you more than interested in donating. I do a moment of silence for the person still struggling with thoughts of big cuts on the time. Okay, thank you for that. And without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce my guest for the day. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Emily. I go by M, and I'm a Bethesda girl from Pebble, Mississippi, uh, 1984 to 1985. And Bethesda was a real walk home, so okay. the religious side. Okay, and uh, can you walk us through, like, what was happening at home before you got sent there? Like, do you know why you got sent there? Can you walk us through that? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Um, I actually was a pretty good student. I never played hooky. Um, I got really good grades. I wanted to run track and everything, but um, I was different from my sister. I wanted to do extracurricular activities. Like I wanted um, to be on the track team. I wanted to go to campus. I wanted to, you know, hang out with friends, but I wasn't even allowed to know my phone number. Um, so um, I got was working at a nursing home in a um, as a like a helper in the kitchen, and um, my mom caught me smoking um, cigarettes. So she had my dad make me eat a whole pack of them, and I got really really sick. I had nicotine poisoning, and I was like throwing up and bumping into walls and hallucinating. It was really bad. I remember like getting butts stuck in my nose and having to try to pick the butts out of my nose. It was really horrible. I was so sick. Um, and I ended up living with uh, my best friend from high school and her family um, wanted to keep me. Um, and from there I went to Bethesda, but like I taught Sunday school, like I never had alcohol. Um, still haven't slept with a guy, never even skipped school, none of that. So, but I was always pretty, pretty rebellious by my parents' standards. I always had a mouth on me. That's never gotten any better. Yeah. Okay, um, so you were just essentially just doing normal uh, delinquent stuff, like just adolescent stuff. Yeah, it's like I, had, I hadn't even tasted beer yet. Or smoke the joint. I didn't do any. I never went to a that that kind of like I didn't go to a high school dance. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we're so quick to jump to conclusions and be like, "Oh, we're getting out of control." I know. It's like, no, they're just being a regular teenager. What are you? Yeah, (laughs) but it was so awful. It was so awful to my mom because you know she, my sister was very very shy. And I'm um, in fact, my sister, I understand she's three years older than me. I understand she still lives at home. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty awful. <laughs> Did you feel like your parents kind of sent you there because they didn't want you at home? Did you feel like that was kind of the situation? Or did you feel like it was just because they felt like you were, quote unquote, out of control and like being rebellious? Oh, I think it was because um, of the... I think they were embarrassed about the cigarette thing because social services got involved because it's um, it's considered abuse to make your child eat a whole pack of cigarettes, even back in the 80s in Colorado. Sure. So social <laughs> services was investigating, and um, I had um, I was out of the home. I was staying with um, my um, friend from school, so I wasn't in the home, and they came to the farm in buyers and had me taken off the farm. And take it to Bethesda, so I think they were embarrassed about what was happening. 
and and trying to put it all on you, right? Like, if this is right. your fault, look at what you did. Yeah, but like my foster parents were like, gee, you're not that bad. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're pretty easy. And um, they wanted to like figure out like, how do we, how can we keep you? That kind of thing. And nope, that kidnapped him since Bethesda. As a matter of fact, after I had been at Bethesda for two months, um, it was not, it was right after the closet incident, actually. I got called to the office without my helper, which was very unusual. And it was, I was terrified because you're on watch for the first three months at Bethesda. Yeah. And um, I got called to the office, and there were two men there that were dressed like Baptist preachers, right? Like the high, tight military cut, the, the suits, the ties, didn't introduce themselves. And then they had the owners of the home in the room, and um, Mrs. Wills was standing right behind me, and she was like, kept pinching me on the collarbone every time they asked me a question. Like, are you happy here? Pinch. Oh, yeah, it's great. You know, if you could leave here today, would you? Oh, no, because pinch. You know, and I'm thinking if I say what's really going on, they're just going to leave me here, and I'm dead. Yeah. Did you uh... then after? I had found out later it was the FBI, and they could have taken me out. I was so mad, so mad. Oh yeah, understandably so. When when you got there, um, can you walk mm -hmm. us through like what you remember about when you when you first got there and like what they what they how'd you do? So yeah, that was that was a bad day, a very bad day. Um, it was kind of like. Oh gosh, I wish he had a picture. It was kind of like a version of an old southern plantation. That was the new dorm. We walked into, we walked onto like the brick veranda and then in through the metal doors. Then they walk up behind you and you're in the veranda. And the first thing you see is a picture of Lester Roloff hanging in the foyer. And, but you don't know who he is. You just see some old guy, like, staring you down. And there, you can tell there's over 100 girls there, but there's no noise. It's absolutely dead silent. Yeah. And you know you're in trouble. Yeah. You know that this is not what they're trying to sell, and you know you're in Yeah, basically. And, like... They they pull you over to the office and you see girls peeking their heads out of the front um, living room to look at you, and they have on dresses and tennis shoes, which I had never seen before. Yeah. And I was like, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. You know, red alert. And I was like, started trying to pull away in Elizabeth. Um, the work, one of the workers grabbed me and um, pulled me into her little room, which was right off the office, and um, pulled me into her bathroom and made me strip down. And I was really upset about it because, you know, I was like a 15 year old virgin. So I was like on my period and I was not happy. Yeah, super invasive. Super invasive, super humiliating. And then she made me do jumping jacks to prove I had nothing but my hoo-ha. <clears throat> so now there's blood flying everywhere. Like, I just want to die. Yeah. <laughs> just like, somebody please kill me now. Yeah. And, um, then they make you get, um, you have to put on the dress. And um, So was dress like the dress code there? Mm, yeah, well, you can wear as long as it's not more than two fingers down from your sternal knot okay. or below your knees. Um, you only have to wear, like, uniforms when you're um, on tour. Then we called those the penguin outfits because they were white, long sleeve polyester shirts and pleated black skirts. Polyester black pleated skirts in Mississippi. In the heat and humidity, like that alone didn't kill us. We were some tough bitches back then. I tell you what, man. Because Lord, yeah. But other than that, we wore the clothes that um either 
our parents sent us if we were lucky enough to have that happen or that um, girls would give us after they outgrew them when we trade amongst ourselves. But we, um, we could not wear pants because okay. that was sinful. Women were supposed to wear dresses because pants were for men. Interesting. Okay, so they, they give you the dress. They, did they go over a rule manual with you? Did they tell you the rules? Did they give you any sort of material telling you like what you can and can't do in the program? They did, but like I was in such shock at that point. It was something, like it was so weird. Like I remember looking at it. The only thing that stuck out in my head was no hippie clothing allowed. <laughs> oh, man. And I was like, what? Because this was 1984. And I was like, yeah, it was like nothing that makes you look like a hippie. And I was like, and I was like, that's, you know, when you're like, oh, I, oh, dear. Yeah. You know, that's the only thing I really remember. But then what they do is they give you to your help, what they call your helper, which is a girl that's been there longer. And um, she's going to watch you for three months. You're going to be within um, basically touching distance of her for three months. And um, you're not going to look at, touch, talk to, um, or talk about another person, another girl that's on watch. Even if there's two more of them in the same room, you, they don't exist. You can't have any kind of contact with them because they're on watch. If that makes sense? Yeah. Yep, they had something similar in the program I went. Okay. Um, and then, so essentially, that other person was essentially your shadow. Like when you get a new job, mm -hmm. you shadow somebody, you know, to show you the ropes or whatever. How long did you have a shadow for? <coughs> um, three months. That was the standard period. But if you got in trouble, you could um, go back on watch for whatever period of time they determined. So you All could right. be stripped of your privileges and put back on watch. Um, that never happens to me. Okay. I went from being on watch to um, getting to be a hall walker like that was a privilege. Okay. Uh, now, you... go ahead. No, that's okay. Go ahead. <clears throat> um, now, in this program, was it points and levels based? Was it uh, where you get like merits and demerits every day? Was it what? How would you? Uh, what was the point of the program? How would you graduate? <laughs> It was a year long. Okay. Always a year Period. long. Period. The whole program was a year, but you had to be there a year. And then you they just graduate you, or would they hold people longer sometimes? Or? Oh, yes, indeed. I was there longer. A lot of girls ended up being there longer, which is horrible. Some were there five, six years, which is heartbreaking. But the period of the contract was a year. You're contractually obligated to be there a year. Um, you know, some parents would come get them early, but it was a big hoo-ha thing, and, you know, they're going to go to hell now because of the parents, that kind of thing. Okay, so if you were there a year, right, what mm -hmm. would you give them have you stay longer? Say, I, I'm guessing essentially anything, but I would figure I'd ask. Uh, or would it be like they just don't feel you're ready to graduate? Was it that kind of thing where they feel like you're ready and then and then you graduate type thing? They never told me. Like, all they said was, you're staying after your year. And I just remember being devastated because, like, I had just about every privilege you could have. Like, I know, uh, after the, like, I would get in trouble if somebody else made me get in trouble. Like, a group thing, but, like, I didn't caused the trouble like I followed every rule every time and like I tried to keep my new girls in line and I always had three new girls and like I really tried to like you know tell the line because I wanted out and then I got told that I was staying and I never found out why I had to stay after my year um I did get to go home for two weeks um well, no. and, but they still never told me and my parents took me on vacation to um, Florida to see my um, one of my favorite uncles, but it was like my mom the whole time was like, "You better not tell them where you're at. This is you know a big shame and it's your fault. You're a horrible person, and this is why we you know we had to do this to you. And you better not tell them where you're at or where you're going back to." And da da da. da. And I was just horrified. So it was bad. 
And then after two weeks, my dad drove me back from Texas to uh, Mississippi. And I was like, I was like, I broke down. I tried to tell him all the stuff that was happening. And I tried to tell him, you know, they're, they're not feeding us. They're starving us to death. We are like not getting fed. And I was pretty tiny. I mean, I wasn't that big, but they were used to me not being big. But like I was small, even for me. And um, like the whole way I was like, please, you know, they're not going to let me eat. And so like he did take me to like a cafeteria style restaurant before and tell me, get whatever you want. So like I ate and I ate and I ate and I ate. And then he said, you still have to go back. And I was like, oh, my God. And we pulled up and like, I think he must have called them to ask about what I was saying because we got in there and it wasn't a holiday or anything and those assholes were having a pig out. Yeah. Interesting. And I, and I was like, fuck, I'm just fucked. I'm just, I'm here until they, they come get me out. There's no escape. Okay. Um, it's very interesting that they don't give people a reason. I suspect that it had to do with money and control. Uh, it usually has to do with those two things. Which is interesting. My family wasn't rich. I mean, my dad worked. My mom did not. And like after I got home, my mom told me I had to repay the loan every month because it was my fault that I went. Yeah, look what you did, right? Yeah. And I did for like a year. I repaid it 60 bucks a month. Um, do you... so I realized I was paying for being tortured. Yeah, it's insane. Do you do you have any idea uh, how much they charge for the program you went to? You know they charge differently for different people. Like how much could they get out of you? Interesting. So it's like a sliding scale of how much they can get. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, they would also take us out to churches to beg for money. Like look, look at these dirty, nasty girls, and look what we do for them. We make such huge sacrifices. Please give us money. So after. They shut down their facilities in Mountain Park and Pablo and stuff. They had um, waterfront property in Florida. They had two side-by-side -side waterfront properties in Florida. That's how poor they were. Okay. <clears throat> Interesting. But Maybe they couldn't afford to feed us all the time. Yeah. Maybe it was more of a control thing for them then. It, it definitely was. I mean, they... Control this with sleep. They control this with exercise. They definitely control this with food. Oh man, they control this with food. It was terrible. <laughs> uh, do you do you now? Do you feel the staff members got off or like uh, like enjoyed inflicting torture on people? Yes. Um, well, but, yeah. They're both torture. It was. Um, the the Southern Poverty Law Center um actually sued Bethesda. Um, during the time period that I was there, and um, they said they were, we were the, um, he, he said he'd never seen people look like us outside of concentration camp survivors. Wow. Um, and that was Morris G's of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Wow. That's insane. Yeah. We had no control over anything that we did. I keep moving my camera, but yeah, we had no control. Of, and when I got out, that was a big problem for me because now I have to make decisions and I didn't know how. I had no idea. Now, did they have any sort of solitary confinement or anything like that there? Yes. I don't know if that's what you... It was a closet. Okay. Yeah, the same and it, and it was uh, it was in the back of the old dorm. I spent some time there because I, I made a, a a a fairly off color joke in response to a racist joke that the elder made. And um I got what they call hamburger butt for that. And then I, I I got a fairly long time in the um, in the closet, and it was just a vacuum cleaner closet that they locked me in. Okay, and do they feed you in there? No, well, bread and uh, thing of juice. 
Okay, so they 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 feed you, but they don't feed you. They don't actually feed you. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I had to go. Because they're that. supposed to be fasting and repenting. Yeah. And they I, play um, Lester roll off tapes twenty four seven. Yeah, it's part of the brainwashing. Uh, did you um, did you guys do schooling there? If you can call it that, we they used the pace system. There were no teachers. Um, the workers just sat there and oversaw what we did, but there were absolutely no teachers. Just basically involved um, the Christian view of very basic stuff. Okay, so it wasn't even self-taught. It was more on religion basis? Like, you go to school. Yeah, and it, I mean, they had math and English and science, but it was, you know, from the biblical point of view, and um, there were no teachers. We went and sat in our cubicles and read the read the little workbooks and then took the test. Okay. Um, was there, how was the food there? I know you kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, did you get to work kitchen at all? Did you enjoy that? I got to work in the kitchen one time in the pantry. And um, I have a like a little almost OCD tick where I like to combine things. Like I don't like to see multiple containers of uh, multiple containers of the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But my brain is like put them all together. Yeah, yeah. Just... <clears throat> so well, while I was doing that, I noticed that there were weevils in in the dry products like the flour and the cornmeal and stuff. So I threw them out. I got a trash bag and I, I threw them in there. Then we went back to the school and Mrs. Wills came flying in here. She's like, who has pantry? And I was like, uh oh, I'm dead. And I, I, I'm like, I do. And she's like, get out here. And she drugged me in there. And she's like, why did you throw this away? And I'm like, it has bugs in it. And she's like, that's just extra protein. Get it out. She made me get it out of the trash and put it back. That's disgusting. That's disgusting. Um, I mean, the food technically, when we had it, it was pretty damn good. But man, we probably would have eaten a hockey puck. We were so hungry. Like, we ate some face and paper. We were so hungry all the time. Did you guys get three meals a day? Or whatever the fuck they call it, they constitute a meal? Technically, except for the fast day, that was Saturday. Okay, so they wouldn't feed you at all on Saturdays? They, we had to skip breakfast, and then we would get, like, lunch and dinner. Interesting. But, like, the portions, they controlled the portions size, and if you were a fat girl, they would give the, you got your small portions would be cut in half if they thought you were a fat girl. Wow. Okay. That's what they would call you, so it would be Skinny girls, got, uh, it was, <laughs> skinny girls would get seconds first, and then normal girls can have seconds, and then fat girls can have a regular sized portion if there was extra food. Wow. <clears throat> okay, so as you've been there for like, um, the longer you've been there, do you gain more privileges while you're there because you said there's like no points and levels so do you like get is there privileges that you gain or do you just stay the same the entire time and then when you're there a year however long you graduate i, I graduate's not the right term because there's no graduation they just come get you your parents just come pick you up okay so you're they done say, they don't say anything like there's no, you have to do this and this and this before you graduate. It's just, oh, when's your year? Like, what day did you get here? That's when you go home, hopefully. Okay. But so you, know, don't, so you don't gain any privileges, like, the longer you're there? Sort of. But it's like, um, you get off watch at three months, and then you start, you can haul walk. Then you can get new girls. Um, the, you might be able to be on outside crew or work or be a cook, but that's where you're going to top out. There's nothing else to do. Okay. Okay. Or maybe maybe a junior worker where they give you keys 
Okay, yeah, that's very similar to something they did at the program I went to. But that's, that, I mean, that's it. Okay. I mean, they're, you're out in the jungle of, of Mississippi. You're not near anything. And there's no TV, there's no radio, there's no, there's nothing. Like, I didn't even know we had a barn. And we did. And, like, I never saw Mr. Wills' airplane, but we would hear him, like, fly and we would hear him take off and land it, but I never saw it. There was 200 acres out there, but I never saw much of it. Okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so how long total were you there? Um, I think, like, 18, 19 months. And uh, did they, uh, were there any runners? What was their policy on runners? Did, did anything happen while you were Oh, there? if a girl would run. We did have a couple would try. Where are you going to go? Yeah. We're in the wilds of Mississippi. If you do make it to a house or to the town, they're just going to bring you right back. Yeah. So nobody, I don't, nobody ever successfully got away. And there was an escape attempt um, earlier, and um, a girl named Connie, um, they, and a couple other girls, they made it out to the highway, and unfortunately, Connie got hit and killed by a truck. Oh, wow. They made the girls go to the funeral and, and look at her body and stuff. And they never, ever stopped using Connie's death. To show girls what happened when you um, stepped outside of God's will and tried to escape. So it was pretty scary. Plus, I mean, it was dark out there at night. If they turned off the lights in Bethesda, there wasn't anything out there. I mean, it was nothing. Yeah. Was there any wilderness survival uh, experience attached to this uh, pro uh, program? <laughs> no. Okay. We were locked in the building. Like, okay. we would get to, like, we, they would, they would take us out, let us across the road to where the, the oak, the clear field was. And so here we would be in our dresses, you know, in 100 degree Mississippi heat with 100 degree humidity playing leapfrog or red rover or wheelbarrow or running laps around that big old field. But they were always watched and always counted. It was just like being in jail. I mean, there was no difference. We were always counted and controlled. The doors were locked. We never went anywhere without. There was no freedom. Okay. Um, how many people would you, if you have to make an estimate, how many people would you say were there when you got there? And how many people would you say were there when you left? If you had to make like a guess. <clears throat> Obviously, it would vary a little bit, but anywhere from... Maybe a high of 130 to 90 something. Okay. When you got there or when you left? Uh, during the whole span of the time that I was there. Okay. Okay. Interesting. And was it just girls? Oh, uh, yes. When originally when I got there, um, the wheels we're running um, Redemption Ranch, which was on the other side of town, and that was for boys. But uh, And we would have church together with them on Sunday because they would bring them over, but like we would have to sit on opposite sides of the chapel. We weren't allowed to look at them or talk to them or communicate with them in any way. But we could always tell if a boy had run, had tried to run because they would catch them and then they'd shave them bald. Um, and then after I'd been there a couple of months, um, the wheels told us that the state had shut them down, but I found out later that's not what had happened. He had sold Redemption Ranch to another preacher. So that was the end of the boys. We didn't ever see them again. Do you, uh, girl. Did, did you hear about or see <clears throat> any staff members like giving any drugs to the people there um, or doing drugs? Did you hear about any of that kind of stuff? That probably would have made life a lot easier, to be honest. No, so it was an IFB home. Because, um, if you're not going to know a Baptist, um, no. Okay. I'm just They're curious. very rabid against that. Um, but if a girl did come in on, like, um, psychiatric medication, 
they would take her off or seize your medication. They would take her off cold turkey. Okay. I was going to ask you that next is if they loaded up people with medication or took them off cold turkey. They would cold turkey them and say it was the devil in them that was making them have seizures or whatever they were doing. Did you, did anybody have any seizures or like die or get really hurt because of that as a result? We had suicide attempts. We had seizures. Um, sometimes we'd have to sit on them. Okay, they never really, very few times when they, they never took anybody to the hospital for that. I never called 911. And there was, and I, I guess, I, I would assume that when people would try and com, uh, commit suicide or whatnot, uh, they would probably be punished for it, right? Lilith, talk it off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Instead of getting help, instead of getting counseling. And if you tried to comfort them, you would get punished too. Was there any therapist there for kids to see? I, I, I waged a knock, but. Okay. No. Okay. Um, let's see. What was the hardest part about being there and how did you deal with it? Um, there was a lot of really hard parts, to be honest. For me, it, it was never knowing when things were going to change, when it was going to go from absolute hours of sheer boredom because there would be nothing to do except read the Bible and it was Bible all the time. Um, to put a board party was going to happen. Um, so it would go from sheer boredom to like sheer terror pretty quickly. And then watching um, Christy, Christy O'Brien, one of the workers, she would tear her apart. She would pick a girl out and she would just tear her apart for hours and just destroy her soul. And that was very difficult. That was horrible. That still sticks out with me to this day. That was just awful. Okay. And how how did you uh, deal with the like when you were struggling really hard, really a lot in the program? How would you deal with that, or did you were you able to deal with it? I dissociated a lot. I think okay. I would just retreat in my head and daydream a lot. I'd just be like going somewhere else. Was there anything that you could do for like an escape? Like, uh, for example, when the program I was in, we weren't supposed to, but you were allowed to have a personal journal or whatever. They could still look in it, but you, so I would like write lyrics. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't remember that. Um, let's see. Was there any positive experience? Is Was there anything positive that you gained out of this at all? Yes, absolutely. Um, I have my sisters from the program. We have been very close since the early 2000s um, through the internet. And they make the experience probably worth it for me. Uh, we're unusually close. We've kind of bonded together over the years. And we've stayed in close contact from the ones that want to. And it's a great support network. And I'm very thankful for that. Awesome. Now, after you went home, let's talk about your reintegration <clears throat> into society. And like, what have you struggled with as a result of the program the most? And just how uh, do you have trouble relating to people? What do you struggle with the most as, as a result? Um, boy, that is a great question. Um, for me, at first, it was just the sheer sensory overload because I had been lost in a building very little like sensory stimulation except for you know somebody screaming at us i mean but, like there was no music no there just was nothing and all of a sudden there's all the, there's all these people talking and there's people like walking at you and just the sheer sensory overstimulation was very difficult for me and i'm just trying to like learning walk with my head up and to look people in the eye was hard like not being submissive was a very difficult lesson for me to learn 
as well as developing critical thinking skills. That I think that was probably the most difficult lesson for me to learn was developing critical thinking skills. Did you feel like you had trouble communicating with people, or like when you got when you got out, like like when people asked, like, because I'm sure you had people that were like, "Where the fuck were you? Like, wh where did you go? Like, or or did you not have that?" Not really, because after I got out, um, I kind of got married right away because um, I turned 18 fairly quickly. I was still pretty terrified that they send me back anyway, even though that doesn't really make sense. Um, and um, it wasn't very stable, so we moved all over the place. And so we had moved from Texas as a teenager. We moved from Texas to Colorado shortly before all this happened. So I had lost my friends from Texas, and I hadn't made very many friends in Colorado. And it took me quite a few years to find my friend from Colorado, whose house I had been living at before um, I was taken to Bethesda. So it, um, I just didn't have a lot of that to deal with, really. And my parents, obviously my mom was like, don't tell anybody where you've been, you know, that's so embarrassing. Like, it's so shameful. Like, you should be so embarrassed, you know, how horrible if anybody finds out about this. And it was just awful. So she was essentially guilt tripping you and shaming you even after the program. Oh yeah, it was it was terrible. It was so awful, and I just I felt like I didn't belong. Like I didn't know who Madonna and Bruce Springsteen was. Then I married a guy who was not prepared. Married and like I had four babies in three years. Had a baby at 19, 20, 21, and 22. And then I had a fifth baby at 24. You know, so obviously I was not coping well. I was not making good decisions. And it was just a terrible period of my life. Do you, do you think it was more difficult raising your kids with having all of this trauma from the program? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I really think it made a huge impact, honestly. Um, just to go from somebody controlling your every move to just be like, eat or swim. Yeah. And then you have all of these babies all of a sudden, depending on you. And you're like, well, I'm doing everything the cult told me to do. And I don't understand why. I, I honestly did not understand why it wasn't working. Yeah. I could not comprehend why it wasn't working. It didn't make, you know, it just didn't make sense why it should be working. That's what it, they said was going to happen. So, so, like, I had four babies. I couldn't even drive. I didn't even know how to drive a car. Yeah. Must have been it was. Close. It was so overwhelming, like, oh my god, I had four babies in diapers at the same time. Oh my gosh, I no wonder I'm nuts. <laughs> hey, we're all nuts, don't feel bad. Uh, I was the only reason I asked that is because I would think that, like, with because, like, with myself, and I know a lot of other people, almost everybody, if they have trauma with them, you know, it's easy to project that on just other people, even if it's your kid, and it's a lot mm -hmm. of it is unconscious. You do it unconscious. You don't even know you're doing it. You know what I mean? You don't. So, so I was very curious if that made it more difficult to raise kids. And oh, yeah, I'm sure my kids would agree. Absolutely. I'm sure my kids would agree. I was not the world's best mom, but I got, I tried and I tried. Like I had to walk everywhere. Like we didn't even have a refrigerator. It was just Oh, it was dreadful. It was bad. Probably really easy to get overwhelmed too. Maybe at the small yeah. like things people would say were smaller things probably would build up, right? I can imagine. That's a great way to put it. That's the best way I think I've ever heard. Yeah, little things would that people would be like, "Be serious," would just leave me devastated. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And, and even now, sometimes I have to remind myself, okay, small bites. You don't have to do, you don't have to do the whole thing. Just 
little bit at a time, you can do it. And yeah, those coping skills all the thing. What what are what are some of the um, most effective coping skills that you have been able to develop over the years to uh, help you calm down from situations like maybe raising your kids or when you get angry or like what what has worked for you? Um, breathing techniques. I was a respiratory therapist for a lot of years, but I have to remind myself stop. You know, take a breath. It's nothing is that big of a deal. And usually, when you stop and take a breath, and okay, so what I found is that if I'm angry about something or if I'm like just in my head a bunch, if I just sit there mm -hmm. and my eyes and just, or if I want to hurt somebody, mm -hmm. I just want to be like, do I do I still want to hurt them? Do I still like? Mm -hmm. still like super like do i actually want to relapse no i don't if i sit there yeah. is it worth it yeah it, it's a grounding i feel like it grounds you it is i used to tell, I used to tell my patients get the flowers and blow the soup so in through your nose out your mouth yeah and you blow all that out and then really think about what's going on be like, okay, yeah, I can deal with this. This is, I've been through worse. I got this. Yeah. And usually you'll find out that you, you do indeed do have this. You can do this, whatever it is. It might not be a conventional way to deal with it, but you, you will find the resources within yourself to deal with it. Yeah. And that's just what you have to remember. Sometimes I just have to remember, I'll just have to tell myself, okay, step away. Yeah. You know, I'm getting to. I have to. Okay, step away, take a breath, and come back and retry. Yeah, yeah. Don't stay in a situation that is is heating you up. Um, yeah, because I have that happen a lot down here in um, Missouri. Because you know I'm down at um, the Agape property a lot. Yeah. And yeah. I have to practice self control quite a bit because I go to all the court hearings for the householders and the, the Agape stuff was happening and. I really had to learn to not say what I'm thinking necessarily. Yeah. Okay. That is very uh, difficult to sit through. Uh, I want to touch on uh, your relationship with your parents. Have you tried talking to your parents about how that program affected you? Uh, with me, I've forgiven my parents, but I'm never going to forget what they did to me and, you know, stuff like that. Where are you with your parents? Um, my dad passed away, and um, so I never was really able to address that. It's just sad. Um, I think he would be horrified to realize, oh my god, she was telling the truth. Um, my mom, I did try to talk to her like maybe a couple of years after I got out and say, you know, this is kind of what really was happening. And she was like, well, your letters were so happy, and, uh, and I'm like, you're reading them. Yeah. We were going to get beaten if they weren't happy. So, and she called me a liar. And um, honestly, I, I haven't talked to my mom in about 30 years. So, I haven't been able to address it any further. Okay. And that's but completely I, fine. That's completely fine. Don't feel any pressure. Yeah. Where you're at. It's kind of a shame because you know that's supposed to be an important relationship in your life, and I don't have that. Well, you know, so sometimes, kind of, sometimes that hurt is just too, too deep and just like too, too seated in you. Um, I know for a lot of people, um, especially if the parents aren't even receptive to like, and they when they try and start the whole projecting back onto you no this is look what you did you deserve like that whole thing and yeah, just not yeah. just, sometimes you just can't win there you know and you just have to yeah stop it, you know? they have to be able to look they have to be willing to meet you halfway exactly they yeah. have to be willing to hear you out yeah and that's um from what i understand my mom has not become any more flexible or understanding so i'm like this is probably just not gonna be worth my time Nothing is worth my mental health, you know? It just isn't. 
Well, and also, I not not giving any parents any excuse, and this is not in any way doing that, but I am saying that I think a big part of it for some parents is the fact that they spent so much money sending their kids there for this long, right? I feel like yeah. that's part of it, and I also feel like the the guilt and the shame that they feel for being wrong about trying to save their child's life and thinking, because back when they sent you there, they thought this was the the only way to save you. They thought this was the right thing to do. So I feel like for a lot of parents, the guilt and the shame is just, they don't, they can't admit that. They can't, I know. they fucked up so bad that they made, they, they, they completely misread the situation. And I feel like that's not excuse, but I understand maybe why people w- won't admit to it. I, I do too. I, I do get it. It, it. it is a blow to the pride, and I get it. But, you know, just, uh, I'm sorry, it would probably go a long way. Oh, yeah. I yeah. fucked up, you know? Like, I I made some not good parenting choices, so uh, the guilt and shame, boy, do I understand. But you've got to be able to, oh, you know what, I messed up there. That was not my shining moment, and I'm sorry. Yeah, you have to be accountable for your part in it. You do. Just you're a fucking complete, 100% shitty human being, right? You are a shitty yeah. human being for doing that, but that doesn't, that's not your whole character. And if you can at least admit that you fucked up and made a mistake, that's growth. Yeah, and it, that just shows that you, exactly growth, that you can change and you can be a better person and you're aware of that flaw and you're like, Okay, I need to work on this. I'm on it. You're not so worried about your self-image that you're not willing to admit that you made a mistake. And help somebody else heal. I think that's the most important thing, I would think. That needs to come before your before your pride would right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. let's talk about your activism a little bit and how you got into your activism and what you're doing recently and how people okay. can get involved if they want to. Great. Um, I've been involved in the activism scene since um, the probably the, the early 2000s. Um, I, uh, um, as soon as I became aware that um, Mountain Park was still open, which was the program that Bethesda owners opened up after they were shut down, they went straight to Missouri and already had Mountain Park ready to open. I found that out and I was like, oh, hell no. Oh my God. Oh my God. I was just so horrified and I felt so responsible. I thought, oh my God, kids, I am so sorry. Like, I, I, I did, I felt totally responsible. And um, we helped a kid named Jordan Blair in a lawsuit um, in Patterson, Missouri. Um, Oscar Stilley was his attorney. And um, that resulted in Mountain Park voluntary closing along with their sister facility in um, Acadia, Florida called Palm Lane. Um, I've assisted with other programs closing over the years and I've always been involved with um, survivor support. Like, if you're you going off the edge, call me, you know, I'm here. Here's my email, here's my chat, here's my DMs as it involved because it's really important because I think as survivors, we're the only ones who understand what we went through. Um, <clears throat> I did not know that there was a non-religious side of the TTI until probably just a few years ago. I just was fighting the religious side. Um, and um, then about three years ago, there was a rally here. I, I moved here um, to Missouri, and right down the road is Agape, and they had a rally for um, Circle of Hope and Agape and everything. And I got to meet um, a survivor from Mountain Park, and I met Amanda. And I got to meet like a lot of survivors, and it's like my whole world changed. And um, it was an amazing day. It really was. It was an incredible day as a survivor. And then um, I've been fighting. Um, I helped with Agape Ranch 
um, which, as you know, voluntarily just closed this past summer. Thank goodness. It was my understanding they were pulling in about $44 million a year. Astounding. And we brought them to voluntary closing, so I'm pretty proud of all the survivor efforts and all the efforts on the part of the legislation um, and all the media, um, such as Judy from the Kansas City Star and um, her writing partner, Laura. They've been an amazing um, set of allies through all of this, and um, it was an incredible fight. Three years of the most intense fighting. Um, I've been going to all of the um, the hearings um, for the Circle of Hope, the householders. I go to um, the ones for all the agape guys. Um, if it's if it's something about agape or beans or smock, I'm there. They're about an hour away from me. Um, but I feel like it's important that the survivors be represented and that the people see that we're people. We're not just a set of allegations that these kids are people and that they matter. And yeah. this is what happens when a survivor grows up. Exactly. And if you don't like me and you don't like my mouth or you don't like me and you don't like what I say, then stop creating more survivors. Yeah. Because this is what happens to us. So I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Do you, uh, so how, how could people get involved with helping with activism if they want to? Um, you can go to uh, Silence. They have a great set of um, material for activism. We Warned Them has a great package. Uh, do you, are you familiar with We Warned Them? I'm I'm sure you are. Yeah, I am. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have uh, Unsilenced yeah. links in the description. I'm not sure if I have We Warned Them in the description, but I have quite a few links in the description. Hey, if you could add, we warned them if you don't have them. They have an amazing um, set of resources for people who want to um, like talk in their community about um, this issue. Um, I do some talks in the community and just fill people in so they understand we're not just troubled teens, but there's way more to us than just that label. Yeah. And um, that we're here and that we're not just going to let this go. That these kids matter and this cannot continue. I was in 1985 for Pete's sake. This is 2024 almost. Can we knock this off? Yeah. Yeah, for real. We certainly need to. Definitely. I was privileged enough to help with the legislation effort here that got the two laws passed. That was amazing. I got to go to DC and talk to federal legislators about the, um, the federal law that we were hoping to get passed and it's still being worked on. It's just been an amazing few years um, to be a survivor and to start getting the word out. To have everybody interested in our stories is just, I never thought this was gonna happen. For years people were like, this doesn't happen in America. Christians don't do that. You're a liar. So that this sort of validation has just been absolutely amazing. Yeah, definitely. And, work we do and um, the householders also, they go to trial September 2024 unless it gets continued again. So everybody do not forget the householders and what happened at Circle of Hope. Yep, stay tuned. Okay. Stay tuned for that. Let's see, is there, um, oh, if you could go back in a time machine and not go through that boarding school, would you do it and why? Knowing what you know now. Oh, Lord have mercy. You know, oh, that's a fantastic question. I think just for the sake of having my sisters alone, I would go through it. Honestly, because some of them are my family. And I say sisters, that's exactly what I mean. It was a hell of an experience, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but having my sisters and um, developing the skills I need to help other survivors. Yes, I probably would. I wouldn't. I'd probably bitch the whole way. Yeah. But I do it. Okay. And is there anything else you want people to know about your experience, or anything that you might tell a parent thinking about sending their kid to a place like this? Please, please, for the love of whatever you hold holy, don't do it. Go do it. If you don't like the child you have now, you are definitely not going to like the child that comes home. 
they are not helpful. They are not tough loving your child. There is nothing loving about this. Whatever your child is doing now is only going to be magnified. And if they're espousing to be a religious program, especially an IFB program, that's not a church, that's a cult. Don't put your babies there. They don't deserve that. Nobody deserves that, no matter what they're doing. Don't do that to your babies. You don't need any more survivors. Thank yeah. you for your attention. Yeah. I appreciate Absolutely. you doing this interview so much. Thank you, babe. Yeah, no problem. And I have two more questions actually for you. So oh, okay. I'm really curious, uh, this being a religious program, are you still religious? Yes. No. Okay. No. So you changed your views on religion. Okay. It absolutely did. I taught Sunday school for disabled um, kids before I went in, and I was religious for a period of time after I came out. But um, no, I. Mm -mm. Um, if God wanted to save somebody who loved him, he could have done it back in Bethesda. We had to get forensic anthropology students to go out and look for burned baby bodies on the property of Bethesda. Yeah. God could have interfered then, and he chose not to. There were babies being murdered and buried on that property in the name of God. I'm, I'm good. Yeah, it's been going on for generations, too. It's crazy. And, yeah, it, it has. We'll do some terrible things, and I know I will get backlash because people will go, not all Christians are like that. And yes, I, I, I understand that the brands that I was subjected to are like that, and they are, you know, they're a cult, and I get it. But I, but I'm good. <laughs> and the last question I have is: uh, Is it your belief that um, these uh, schools could or uh, should or even could be fully regulated, or is it your belief that they should all just be shut down? The remaining ones. Personally, I would like them to all be shut down. I, I don't think they serve a purpose. Uh, but in my case, I would like to point out that the religious schools here in Missouri are not even licensed. So at a bare minimum, I think they should be licensed and regulated at a bare minimum. But they we can't to. even get that to happen here in Missouri. They have to be. At the very least, they have to be regulated and they have to be, um, you know, um, licensed. Yes, but we can't even get that to pass here in Missouri because, you know, Bible Belt. But um, I, I think they should be shut down because sodomizing a child prevent them from being gay or feeding them salad or beans because they can't quote your Bible or them awake for days at a time and make you face a wall is not going to fix anything, I can assure you. Personal experience, it's not going to help your child. For sure. Um, if anybody wants to contact me, you can. For sure, your child most likely just needs like a good a good therapist that actually understands them. And maybe even like family counseling. So the parent. I would make it a family. I would make family counseling a priority. Find out what the issues are going on in the family. Like, I, I wasn't that bad of a kid, but like, why did my mom make me eat a pack of cigarettes? Something's not right there. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and if the worst thing I was doing was smoking cigarettes, that makes me a pretty good kid, actually. Yeah, compared to what you could be doing, definitely. Yeah, so it have been a lot worse, Mom. Sure. I used to say to my, I used to say, I, I hope somebody don't takes as much care in taking her nursing home as she did my boarding school. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank, um, you so, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. If you ever want to do a part two, uh, just let me know. We'll make it happen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys so much. If you've watched so far in the video, please make sure you like the video, share it, and subscribe to the channel and to be updated whenever new videos drop, which is, I'm doing it every week now. So every eighth day, not not every seventh day, but every eighth day. So it's the actual full seven days. In the <laughs> this is the video. That's part. awesome. So I have OCD like that. So we're, we all, but yeah. Anyways, we'll see you guys on the next one.